Good morning. Good morning. If you need your second cup of coffee, go right at it. But I want to encourage you to be efficient and demonstrate energy efficiency in returning right away because this particular conversation is one that is brand new to Energy Solutions Week, featuring equity as an accelerant to transition is a strategy that we haven't seen at Energy Solutions Week at Stanford previously. And my name is Holmes Hummel, the first director for Energy Equity and Just Transitions at Stanford's Institute for Energy. And I'm deeply honored to be able to share the stage this morning with four members of the Academic Council who are bringing to our closest colleagues here some of their insights of practice and research. Previous to becoming the Managing Director for Energy Equity and Just Transitions, I served as the Senior Policy Advisor at the United States Department of Energy. And I continue a field practice that focuses on accelerating transition in the most carbon intensive part of the US power sector. It is not a coincidence that the dirtiest segment of the power sector in the United States is also well known to reach 90% of the counties in the United States recognized for persistence in high poverty rates over the last 30 years. This coincidence also highlights that underserved market segments are constraining the addressable market for the clean energy solutions that you just heard about from the Sustainable Finance Institute colleagues. They're slowing the pace of market development in a way that also has a toll on popular support across vast demographic and geographic landscapes. For that reason, I join with my colleague, Dr. Anthony Kinslow, in offering the course called Quest for an Inclusive Clean Energy Economy, where we study the removal of those barriers to participation as a method of accelerating deployment using some of the methods you'll hear about next. We'll hear from each of these four faculty members in sequence, but I want to highlight Ines Aceveros as our initial speaker because her commitments to our students and the quality of energy education at Stanford will deprive us of her participation in a later stage Q&A. So we're going to offer questions and answers to you in six or seven minutes right here following Professor Acevedo's remarks, and then we will collect your questions and answers in an open dialogue for the remaining academic council members at the end. Let me proceed with those introductions now that you can appreciate the significance of their contributions on this panel for creating energy systems for an equitable transition to sustainability. Professor Ines Acevedo is, a, is passionate about solving problems that include environmental, technical, and economic policy issues where traditional engineering approaches play an important role but cannot provide a complete answer. In particular, Professor Acevedo is interested in assessing how energy systems are likely to evolve, and this requires comprehensive knowledge of the technologies that can address future energy needs and the decision-making processes applied to a wide range of agents in the economy. I'm going to finish my introductions for their other three colleagues uh, before ceding this podium to Professor Acevedo. Professor Adam Brandt, seated to the right, is an associate professor in energy sciences and engineering, where he is interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, energy supply, and from power sectors through carbon capture and sequestration. Professor Brandt's research in this area uses two types of tools, including life cycle assessments to rigorously account for the environmental impacts for our energy sources, and process optimization for energy systems to improve their efficiency. We'll hear more from him in a moment, followed by Professor Ram Rajakapal. Professor Rajakapal is an associate professor for civil and environmental engineering at Stanford, where he directs the Stanford Sustainable Systems Lab. The lab is focused on large-scale monitoring and direct data analytics, stochastic control for infrastructure networks, and in particular, power networks. That's why you won't be surprised to know that he's one of the founding researchers and director of the Precourt Institute's Bits and Watts Initiative. His current research institutes in power systems are in the integration of renewables, smart distribution systems, and demand-side data analytics that correspond with demand-side decarbonization, where we find some of the most dramatic potential for advancing equity and accelerating energy transition. 
And last but certainly not least, a lion in energy studies at Stanford, Professor John Wyant, Professor of Management Science and Engineering, Director of the Energy Modeling Forum, and the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium that has participants from more than 60 countries around the world. Professor Wyant's aim is to accelerate the use of systems models at state, country, and global scales to provide the best available information and insight to governments and private sector decision makers. He has been an advisor to the United Nations, the European Commission, the United States Department of Energy and many federal agencies, as well as California's energy agencies that govern the pace of transition here in the state of California where advancing equity is a central strategy for accelerating transition. Please join me in welcoming these four academic council members, starting with Professor Aceveras. Welcome everyone, and hopefully you can hear me just right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be allowed by OMS, who as you can see is very strict on the organization and extremely articulate, as she's a model for, for myself, to allow me to provide this presentation um, uh, fairly quickly and address your questions so that I, don't, I can jog, but don't need to run to uh, the class that I'm teaching on the other side of campus. Um, so we'll be talking about a just and sustainable uh, energy transition. And I'll start by highlighting a few steps that we undertake in, in terms of doing so. Um, last year, uh, we produced an uh, opinion piece in the New York Times really thinking about, okay, there is no time to waste. We can spend a lot of time debating how to get to 100% renewables. Uh, doesn't matter. We just need to get there and keep going, uh, articulating between academia how we're going to do that last beat. That, that's fine, but the industry can go ahead and just move forward. We know what we need to do in terms of decarbonization. Uh, of the power sector, a transition for electrification where possible, and just move ahead with that. The second thing is that on Earth Day, I had the opportunity to be interviewed by the Scientific American, uh, and the question was really, um, what are you optimistic about in uh, light of our climate progress and where we need to head in terms of mitigation? And of course, I started rambling about the things that I was pessimistic about rather than optimistic about. But one of the really optimistic things is to see the growth in renewables uh, in uh, electricity generation throughout the, the globe. When we're thinking about what makes this energy transition just and how can we move it forward more quickly, I, I will echo some of the issues that the previous panel has mentioned which can be summarized as follows. We need to define, define what's the scope of the emissions, this, the, define what are the stakeholders, define what are the metrics for equity and environmental justice. We then need to measure and find some way to track the progress. Um, we need to engage with stakeholders and with the different parties that are affected by our choices. And here at Stanford, we do have a few folks that are really at the forefront of doing so, including Holmes and Michael Bora and Sibyl Diver, where they really go to the engagement with some of um, the groups that are traditionally underrepresented in these discussions. Um, we need to assess the implications of different policies and finally provide some recommendations. So I'd like to run over some of the efforts that we've been pursuing here. Um, in terms of uh, each of these points. So in terms of defining, the core of our research really focuses on tracking both greenhouse gas emissions as well as other types of damages that have serious implications across different demographics. And one of such is health damages from criteria pollutants, both from the power sector, from transportation, and from other in uh, industrial sectors. Um, this poses a, a challenge because the behavior of greenhouse gases and criteria pollutants is fairly different. There may be some win-win solutions as we transition to sustainable energy technologies, but not necessarily, and there may be some trade-offs as we move along 
these different important goals of decarbonization and reducing air pollution while accounting for environmental justice. The air pollution consequences are really uh, another facet that is quite dominant and important to track down as we think about just transitions, given that uh, PM 2.5 is still one of the largest environmental global health risks, predominantly associated with emissions that occur in energy services and the energy sector, occurring both in terms of direct combustion that emits PM 2.5 as well as precursor pollutants. So how can we measure? So we define this sort of problem about let's find a transition, let's mitigate some of the impacts from climate change and from air pollution. Second step, let's measure. Here at Stanford, we've been doing really uh, cutting edge uh, measurements across different dimensions. You'll hear uh, from um, Adam Brandt also on other facets of the, the energy system. But some of the work that was done um, earlier on by um, Jacques Schallander, uh, Sally Benson, and then myself on uh, other sorts of databases is really to articulate what are the emissions hourly of CO2 and other criteria pollutants for the grid, and how would those change under different pathways for transitions? What you see here is uh, near real-time estimates of um, emissions uh, of CO2 for each of the US balancing areas uh, on the right. We've been measuring also by developing models that track the change in not only emissions, but coupling it with air quality models to look at the damages imposed in terms of premature uh, mortality associated with air pollution. And we've been making all of this publicly available online so that any decision maker that wants to go ahead and track the emissions and damages in dollar values from um, electricity consumed in their area can do so. So in terms of moving forward on standards and, and understanding how to do so, um, we, we have a tool to do just that, and we have several different methods to assess it, whether it's marginal or um, average emissions factors and damages. On the issue of engaging, looking at the implications for de different demographic groups, some of our earlier work has looked at the premature death um, associated with the electricity sector operations in the United States. We've since expanded that to other regions, and we have a lot of work going on uh, pertaining to India-related uh, damages. But just in a nutshell, one of the key things that we've observed is that across the United States, um, we have premature deaths associated with air, with air pollution just from uh, electricity generation that are around 5.3 premature deaths per 100,000 people. But what you observe in this plot is that some groups of our population are more exposed to air pollution than others. This is dependent on the grids, the location of our cities and the way we are organized. But we see that across all income groups, black African Americans are exposed to higher levels of uh, pollution and resulting premature mortality than other groups when it comes to electricity generation across the country. And then assess and policy recommendations. So we have pursued assessments of um, potential policy alternatives that would look at just reducing CO2 emissions at the lowest cost versus actually explicitly accounting for air pollution consequences and CO2 emissions together. The types of strategies that would be pursued in terms of where to retire coal power plants predominantly and what to build instead are vastly different when we consider those things together rather than in isolation. Still on the assessment and policy recommendations, we're putting tools together for decision makers across uh, the US and we're now moving to, this, to do this tool globally. Um, that provide the best, um, the most cost-effective path for fleet 
turnover and changes in decisions. What you see over here is an abatement supply curve. We're going side by side and looking at current fleet and their operations and they define for those nearby locations whether the most cost-effective strategy is to replace an existing coal power plant with new natural gas or wind or solar while accounting for the explicit resource availability for renewables in that same location and while assuming that we need to pair up renewables with storage to have the ability to have firm power. And we're putting this tool out there so that decision makers in different um, regions across the US can use informed decisions on how potential replacements would play out. Um, I'll stop here to see if there are any questions. I think we have a lot of work still to be pursued ahead, um, but that we're already moving uh, forward and charging ahead with helping with the sustainable energy transition. And flipping things a little bit around by having explicit consideration of equity issues. And with that, I'll open up for questions um, and we'll go ahead unless, Holmes, do you want to take over for anything or? I see Maxim has a person who's got a, right next to your right hand, there's the right, exactly. Thank you. Say your name, please. My name is Somitra. I am from Kaust, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, I can relate to this topic very well because we have uh, Major, um, um, major challenges with SOX, NOX in particular matter due to oil burning. My question is, um, um, have you considered or plan to consider the uh, climate penalty, uh, quantify that when you reduce SOX, NOX, how much of that would impact your CO2 targets, reduction targets and net zero targets overall? Uh, so if I understand your question, I think we've tackled that indeed so that for every single strategy that we look at, we consider the different alternatives, which are, okay, what happens if your decision process is just minimizing private costs plus reducing CO2 emissions versus just air quality versus both, and showing the trade-offs in costs across all of those. So what we do is really using the emissions of SO2, NOx, and primary PM, feed them in uh, three different reduced form air quality models to understand what the impact of such will be and monetize those damages, include that explicitly in the decision-making process. And uh, just to, while I focused on the um, uh, electricity sector, we're doing exactly these sorts of strategies also when considering electrification of transportation, including um, heavy duty vehicles, yeah. I see one hand over here. Um, I have, do you have examples where your models have been implemented and what are some case studies where those trade-offs have been made? It's some, something I was asking the technology panel yesterday about how do you account for the social and environmental costs of of pollution, and it sounds like you're doing that, but I'm wondering, do you have examples of success? So in terms of applications to different types of choices, we, we have plenty in, uh, in peer-reviewed papers looking at decisions of uh, electrification of transportation. In terms of use and real-world decisions, um, earlier on, Boston University, when thinking about the procurement of renewables that they would uh, decide to do, used our information on such decisions to understand where to procure wind. And uh, that was directly used in their um, decision-making process. So that will be one key example. We'll love to do more, right? But at the same time, as we pursue and have these tools available, now it's a little bit up to who is interested in these sorts of applications and using this, this work that we've been put together for their own decision-making purposes. Um, so excellent question and looking forward to doing more in that regard. Yeah. To follow up on that question, do you guys have a plan or a roadmap on how you want to engage nonprofits and other decision-makers to use your tools? Are there seminars, sessions, things like that that you're uh, actively planning at the moment? 
is that David Chen from Murata Energy? Yes. Thank you. I mean, a, a global manufacturer interested in innovation investments seven years out, thinking about a collegial relationship with the university. That's a wonderful open invitation. That's right. So, so the short answer is that I'll defer that to Holmes and others uh, um, also in the pre-court leadership on what's going on in that, uh, on that front. Um, that seems spot on. And so if there is no plan in place, I'll probably reach out to you for help on uh, going about that. Yeah. In fact, in addition, I would say we need to, thank you so much, Arpita. We need to move on to make sure we have equal and adequate time for our remaining speakers. But I want to invite all of you to heed David's uh, interest and open invitation for further engagement. At 1 o'clock today during the lunch break, there will be a gathering in the family room, which is behind the lounge here in the Alumni Center, where there will be folks who are interested in decarbonization from the demand side of our markets, creating more rewards for people who are bringing solutions like the kind that Dave's company has in mind. Professor Acevedo, thank you for making time for us today. Let's see. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Adam Brandt here uh, from Energy Science and Engineering. I'm going to give you a kind of a preview today of, of some work we've been doing uh, on modeling energy system transitions in California. Um, high level of overview, California is just one possible application. Um, I'll talk about. Um, uh, towards the end, I'll talk about uh, kind of future um, things that we're going to try to do with the model. Um, there's a lot of questions about the future of the California energy system, and we've been zooming in on this. Um, you know, lots of questions off to the right, um, you know, that you, you might throw out there. I think, um, you know, to make good decisions about the future of energy in California, we need to do a number of things simultaneously. One is we need to model uh, energy supply and demand at a regional level. California is, you know, fairly large and has a lot of different geographies with different uh, climates, um, uh, you know, sort of economic willingness to pay, uh, density, all sorts of factors that vary, you know, quite a bit over a pretty large region. We really need to account for hourly supply and demand interactions as we uh, integrate more renewables that have this sort of hourly characteristic and this non-dispatchable characteristic. We need to include those. And importantly, we need to coordinate between the gas and electric uh, systems. So to date, historically, many of the capacity expansion or sort of future grid simulation models that have been used um, haven't sort of integrated between the gas and electric networks. And so um, what we've been doing is trying to build models that, uh, that do that. And so we're basically building a region-specific integrated gas electric uh, coordinated transition model. Uh, sometimes you, you sort of uh, strike gold or catch the tiger by the tail. Um, we came up with this acronym. Our model is called BRIDGES, Building Resilient Integrated Decarbonized Gas Electric Systems. If nothing else, I'm happy with the acronym. Um, what this does is basically takes the traditional um, electric grid simulation approach, also couples it underlying at the same time uh, a natural gas system, and then has all these points of coupling like gas to power and power to gas, where, for example, if we have excess renewables in a future energy system, we can turn them into hydrogen or turn them into synthetic methane, store them and use them in the winter, right? And so this flexibility allows us to do this. Um, and we have to do that, we have to solve the admittedly simplified, but solve the physics of the gas and electric systems simultaneously. Uh, right now we're working on California, we're modeling it uh, reasonably simply. We have 16 uh, physical nodes, four import nodes, and two offshore nodes for uh, modeling offshore wind. Uh, we have data on electricity and gas demand by hour and by sector for each node. And these are generated based on a California Energy Commission uh, building climate zones where we can get really this pretty amazing what data is available now. Um, Time, an important thing about these kinds of models and something to kind of emphasize is that time is really challenging to model and the time scales are very divergent. If we're talking about transitioning to a clean energy economy, this really is a cleanliness sort of an investment target that unfolds over years to decades. But at the same time, stability of the grid unfolds at sub-second kind of time scales, right? So we're really trying to build a system that's stable, operational, and provides, meets demand, meets energy services. Um, at a secondly time scale, at the same time that we've got our eye on the ball or, sorry, or our eye on this target uh, for decadal, um, uh, you know, sort of goals. Uh, we have a variety of uh, temporal reduction techniques. I won't, I just, you know, I put those up here. I don't really have time to talk about them. Um, but we try to do this in a computationally efficient way, but still represent the actual behavior of each of these nodes in the system. One important thing that we were able to do here, oops, uh, 
sorry. Um, one important thing that we were able to do here on the bottom right, this model has a really detailed accounting of the capital stock. So basically for each of these regions, we can say, okay, how many uh, multifamily homes are there? How many of those have electric heat? How many of those have gas heat, right? So we have a very disaggregated view of the ages and appliance uh, sort of um, vintages, the populations of appliances in these models. And my student Mo has been digging into that and getting very detailed data on that. Um, so we do have our network topology. We have, you know, by node, things like hourly uh, variable renewable energy profiles. Um, we also have some really detailed appliance data from um, uh, federal uh, red stock and com stock databases, they're called, where basically we can get hourly demands for each of these regions. Uh, you know, we plug these into our model. These are some of the sim uh, simplified results we can get. This is days uh, 323 to 329, so late November. Um, in year one, you can see here we've got um, a, sort of a daily um, uh, generation peak that happens. It depends on the day, of course. Uh, with a lot of this dark gray is um, uh, natural gas combined cycle. We do have the solar dome. California is already in 2020 in our initial year already has a lot of solar, uh, but a lot of gas. And then you see here as we get to the bottom, uh, this is year 2025, a huge amount of solar and that line below, uh, below the X axis, that's actually dumping electrons into synthetic fuels, right? So what it's actually doing is replacing the gas side of the system, the industrial side of the system, by taking this excess solar and generating in this case, um, electromethane and electrolytic hydrogen. So we can model that and we can couple the two and we can model the flow. Okay, so you know, one last slide, since we're talking about you know, policy relevant questions, we're talking about equity, we're talking about all these social aspects, we can actually model uh, these kinds of things and we can model policies with this tool. And my postdoc, um, or a postdoc I co-advise, Morel de Paras is, is in the audience, she's starting to work on this. Um, you know, we can look at things like, what if there's a new build limitation on gas infrastructure? No new gas hookups. What if we say, well, instead we're gonna limit supplies uh, or sales of gas appliances, or we're going to subsidize or unsubsidize, so let's say we subsidize electric appliances. Um, what if instead we target early retirement with subsidies? We say, well, if you have an old piece of equipment, the state or the utility will write you a check if you replace it with a new, a uh, new appliance with more efficiency or a new appliance that's electric. We can model all these options and then see how this spins out over the simulation over the whole state. We also are, are planning on zooming in on a more granular level and look at things like, which we, we think we can do with this model if we do a high resolution approach. Um, one concern I have with the transition is it's fairly haphazard. So I recently completed a three year complete electrification project for my home. I'm a Stanford professor. They pay me too much. I can do this kind of thing. So I've, got, I've gone all electric. But this is a very haphazard approach, right? This isn't a, doesn't seem like a very structured, efficient approach where we say, well, let's target regions where we can most efficiently electrify. So can we, for example, pre-plan pre -plan, pre -plan retirement and say, okay, this region of the gas grid is old. Let's electrify that region, um, you know, target that. Then we can shut it down, reduce our, our cost of, of maintenance of the system. We can look at how valuable, you know, large scale um, gas infrastructure might be. So even in a system where we're gonna prune a lot of the end uses of gas, we may need these trunk line or transmission scale systems. If we're, for example, gonna electrify heating, we may have huge surges of heat demand in the winter where we're still gonna need this gas, gas infrastructure with hopefully carbon capture and storage. And then something that Moraldi's interested in, you know, what happens if we disaggregate these nodes into different income tranches? So each of these nodes, uh, you can model different income tranches with have, with have different uh, income, different willingness to pay, right? Different rates of home ownership versus uh, renting, right? And so as you promulgate these policies or these electrification policies, how do those um, uh, sort of affect these different regions differently and the different uh, kinds of people that live in the different regions? So these are all interesting policy relevant questions. We've really been focusing on model building um, and now we're starting to get our model working so we can start to tackle interesting questions. We're starting to work on offshore wind and long-term storage case studies in California. We're starting discussions on a Northeast regional case study, um, uh, looking at, you know, sort of uh, Boston to New York City urban region. Um, you know, we're mostly, to echo Holmes's call for engagement, we're mostly limited by, not imagination maybe, time to implement and explore. The framework is really capable. Um, we're looking for projects to work on and we, um, you know, I think we can do a lot with it. So we're excited to hear from you if you, if you think there's interesting questions we can answer. Um, I don't know how I did on time there, Holmes. Thank you. Yeah.
I, try, I, tried, to, I tried to be quick. <laughs> so um, it's great to follow Ines and Adam with, with these really exceptional presentations. I want to talk about a specific aspect of this transition that I'm very interested in, and it's kind of the work we do in our group, which has to do with electrification. So when you think about electrification and how you know, this is positioned in the energy transition, we all are aware that the, one of the kind of key ideas behind decarbonization is this so-called electrify and decarbonize. We are gonna decarbonize the electricity grid, which is about 30% of emissions, and we are gonna electrify a lot of end uses and count on the fact that the grid has been decarbonized to get about 65% of emissions off the table. Um, and if you look at the picture I have put up here, you know what's happening right now is we are seeing on the generation side of the grid extremely fast changes. And we are starting to see the decarbonization or the electrification efforts trying to pick up pace. But there is questions about how much can we do and how fast can we change. And the main limitation, in my opinion, is that the end users are connected to the generation through the grid itself. And there has been very little change, and the expectations are the changes are going to be very slow on that pipe connecting these two sides. So there are questions about how are we going to be able to get the speed, the scale, and the reach. And we can go over these very quickly. Let's start with speed. Here, we did a study where we actually took all of the uh, DOE projections over all of the different end uses and placed it in various you know, distribution networks around the country, rural, urban, commercial, in different weather zones, and so on and so forth. And I'm just showing like, you know, how much uh, electrification is expected to increase the energy use. And you can see 35% you know, on commercial by 2050, 10% uh, or a little bit more on residential. And one question is, as we are speeding up this adoption of electrification, what's happening to the grid? And here's the question, what's happening? If you look at one measure, which is how many transformers will be overloaded on all of these different example networks that we have, uh, very quickly transformers are overloaded. And you know, by 2050, 90% of them will be overloaded. So that you see this is an actual real problem. Today, if you have to do an electrification project and you require a transformer upgrade here in Northern California, there's many regions where you have to wait for a year or more. In San Francisco, high speed EV chargers will only be allowed to be installed starting on 2026 to 2028 because of the lack of grid capacity. But there is hope. To solve the speed, one of the things that we need to do better is coordination. And coordination means coordinating end users across consumers allows you to actually avert a lot of these uh, uh, overloaded transformers. As you can see out here, instead of replacing 90% of the transformers, if we can coordinate our end use and the intelligence that's embedded in there with the fact that these transformers are one part of the pipe, and there's a very other, various other elements that constitute our reliability, we can actually um, avoid a lot of the needed upgrades and bring down instead of 90%, in this case, to 30%. This coordination has to go beyond that, though, because even for deploying projects, you know, the designing, permitting, building, and installing them, we don't have the scale today, even in California, for what we need to do. So coordination also has to happen on that level, um, and I think this will be a very important task. And part of this is driven by standards, both on the codes, but also standards in communication and controls that we have been um, advocating for establishing as well. The next question is about scale. I'm just showing there in 2013, uh, in blue, you can see what's called a net load for the whole of California. That's just all of the loads added up minus all of the renewables. And that includes all of the rooftop solar and so on. If you think about a particular area like Palo Alto and the local grid here, there's something similar happening and sometimes actually more extreme. Well, in 2013, that's where we were. 
On 2019, you can see what's called the duck curve very clearly because of solar. And the expectation, if you look at all of the future model studies, is that we will have in our net load moments where the grid potentially will go below zero in the net load, which means we have to curtail that power. And now that poses one question. Right now, when we think about end users, we are always thinking about efficiency and cost, and we attribute it to if you use less electricity, you're more efficient, then you cost less. Well, in this picture here, in fact, if you use a lot, as long as it's, you're using in the daytime, actually, it's great. You're cheaper than something more efficient. So in that little picture I have there, the blue bar uses double the amount of energy than the orange bar. But the blue bar has a big advantage. It is very flexible because it's using a lot of power because then I can schedule it in the time when the grid is actually producing a lot of renewables. So extracting that flexibility from the loads is gonna require a lot of automation and intelligence, but also we need to start rethinking everything on this frame. Last year, in the end of the year, we published a paper showing that the current policy that's promoted in California about charging your EVs at home actually can result in us requiring 25% more storage than what's planned for our state. But if we just ask people to charge during the daytime, then you don't have any addition of storage. And so, again, it's very important to think holistically and about the whole system and the constraints of the grid. The last piece that I wanted to touch upon, which is very important, is I, I called it reach. And this is all about the equity. It's very clear that right now, as we look at the end use electrification, it is quite non-equitable. So let's just start with the picture on the right. We actually used AI and mapped all of the solar deployments in the United States from satellite imagery available uh, in Google Maps. And what we found was really interesting. First of all, if you compare non-disadvantaged communities and disadvantaged communities, and you look at the residential, which is like the second uh, panel there, uh, the middle panel, the letter E, uh, there is a 61% gap on solar equity. That means there's 61% more solar panels normalized by population or buildings or area and the rooftop and all measures that you want is gonna be very similar numbers if you are in a non-disadvantaged community as defined by the Justice 40 effort from, from the federal government. But the one interesting thing is that, um, well, we also actually studied what is causing that. And what we found is a lot of the incentive policies that we have enacted actually tend to accelerate the inequity. So for example, if you wanna increase residential disadvantaged community adoption of solar, you need performance-based incentives, which depend just on the number of kilowatt hours that, that you produce, versus um, the other type of um, incentives that you have. But one another interesting aspect is if you look at commercial, that gap is much smaller. Okay. And finally, I just wanted to show you this picture on the left is the undergrounding rate of um, our distribution grid across California. And if you look at the curve in red, that is for the high fire risk regions. And what is very striking is that a lot more undergrounding is happening where your income is higher. And actually, even if your fire risk is very low, you have a lot more undergrounding than when you have, you're in a region with low income. And one of the things that we are uh, advocating is now using these AI tools, you can actually track all of these issues and start to consider them uh, in your investment decisions on that pipe. So it's very important to think about the pipe and the constraints that it puts on what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. I appreciate that contribution. While John Wyant's uh, slides are being put, queued up there, I want to point out that uh, there are many people in the audience who are aware of the federal policies that produce these effects. Uh, they're not discoveries made like uh, nobody knew that for 30 years a tax credit policy that was patently discriminatory against people 
who didn't have tax liability would create these types of gulfs, but they do take a toll on the demographic and geographic support for the policies that shape the market conditions that many of the affiliates of the Institute are interested in manifesting in order to accelerate investment. You've drawn those connections very eloquently and nicely this morning. I know that John Wyant is gonna finish us off with his contributions of scholarship before we turn back to our audience for exchange. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Holmes. I'll try to go quickly because we're running out of time here. Uh, so it, uh, um, I'm gonna report on behalf of a big team of us uh, who have been working on a project on uh, California's route to carbon neutrality. I'll describe that in a little bit more detail in a, uh, the next slide. Uh, so this is a fairly big project. It's been going on a little bit over two years. The PI is Lenore. Uh, the project manager is Sarah Saltzer. A couple of our colleagues on the panel are on the team that put the uh, project together. And first and foremost, the two people at the top, Andrew Person and Josh Nutell uh, did uh, most, all of the modeling work um, with a little bit of input from us. I, I do feel obliged listening to the previous session in this one to kind of locate this work in a bigger space. Uh, as Holmes mentioned in the introductions, I've worked a lot on national and uh, global and uh, state and even some uh, regional models. I think if you look at the talks that were given in the last session and this session, there does seem to be a commonality in a way in that we're kind of trying to decide whether to do policy and modeling from the top down or the bottom up across all those scales. And this, uh, it turns out, is very hard. Uh, and I, I do think in order to get bigger, better information for higher levels, you have to drill down and do more dis disaggregation all the time. I thought I was gonna be talking about this study being the most disaggregated, but I think our colleagues have kind of slipped down into that thing. On the other hand, um, as Bob Litterman said, if you're gonna, and, and actually the juxtaposition with Mark Rostin was interesting, if you're gonna start from the bottom up, you've gotta look at how that's gonna affect the, the top down and be aware of where you're gonna connect up with other things that are going on in looking at each kind of highly uh, disaggregated in space, time, or complexity analysis. So the other dimension that this study hits is, uh, by the way, we conceptualize, we can conceptualize as much as we, we want, uh, but in many jurisdictions, the trains are running and running fairly aggressively. Uh, so this study was actually uh, based on the fact that in California, we have very specific uh, uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets to reduce uh, emissions uh, by 2030 and completely by uh, 2045, 40% uh, 40, 40%, sorry, uh, by 2030 and 100% by 2045. So the train is running. So therefore it becomes interesting to look at uh, what the policymakers are actually thinking of doing and what the analysis behind uh, their discussions of what policies to pursue uh, are. So uh, essentially uh, what we've done is taking this picture and looking at what the California Air Resources Bar, uh, Board, who's the requisite uh, uh, body in California for figuring out what to do to achieve the objectives the legislature and others, governor, have, have, put, have put forward. So this is actually the, the scoping plan preferred or proposed scenario that CARB put out. Um, and, and it basically says, in order to get there, uh, as shown on this trajectory, we have to triple the amount of installed solar, build 20 gigawatts of offshore wind, electrify 20 million cars, and reduce fossil fuel combustion uh, uh, to less than one-tenth of what we use today, and also um, install 100 megatons of carbon capture and storage, both point source and uh, direct air capture. So what the team did, our modeling team, uh, did was essentially build another model that's similar in structure, but not exactly the same as the model uh, CARB used. Uh, it, it is a, a application of a pre-existing uh, platform called the Low Emissions Analysis Platform, or LEAP, and basically do our own reconstruction of both the CARB baseline and the CARB proposed scenario. And the reason to do that was to get an idea of what was involved in is it 
easy or hard to get there and what might some alternatives be, uh, we focus mostly on emissions cost and resource constraints, not as much on equity yet, although we're down at the level of individual plants and facilities where it would be easy and located in specific uh, locations, it would be easy to add on to that some of the excellent uh, work that you've heard described before on the equity and uh, diversity uh, dimensions. Um, so uh, we reconstructed their, uh, their uh, baseline and uh, proposed scenario and then did a, a mammoth amount of sensitivity testing to see what was important and what was consequential. We did this every which way you could think of and came up with a um, kind of set of things we wondered uh, about how feasible they were and whether or not there might be a better way to get there. So rather than do a counter modeling to CARB, we said maybe we can constructively uh, kind of decompose with what they've done and shed a little bit more light on what some of the trade-offs, uh, equity included, uh, might be involved in trying to achieve those objectives. Um, and so we came up with our own um, uh, kind of summaries, uh, part, uh, excuse my French uh, spelling of summary uh, there. Uh, and uh, you can get much more detail on what we actually did from Josh and Andrew during the uh, poster sessions at 11.50 and 4 uh, today. But the summary conclusions so far are the top line, probably no surprise to this gr group, electrify everything and decarbonize the grid. I actually did a paper on exactly that subject with exactly that so, uh, conclusion in uh, two, 2006, by the way. Um, and uh, secondly, all technologies and resources, in our opinion, will be needed to get to net zero by 24, 2045. I'd like to end with uh, three kind of interesting uh, conclusions that we've come up with so far that was and is driving our development of new scenarios that go deeper in that direction and try to identify alternatives. We looked at the poster a couple of days ago and it looks like the posters at the end will actually go in some of those directions. One is electrification in California at the rate that's uh, desired will require major expansions to, to, to the existing grid. Uh, Ram covered that, of course, and others. And uh, going from 97.5 uh, to 100% renewables gets very expensive. This was actually a big surprise to us. We expected that uh, knee and the curve to be more like 80, between 80 and 90%. So we're up at 95 uh, to 100. Electrification of transportation is key. Uh, a lot of the results have um, solar with battery on the, that end of it, and then EVs, no surprise to this group, as a big part of the solution. Uh, but surprisingly, even with the aggressive goals announced by the governor and others, we don't think the current policies may move the needle fast enough to actually get there, where you're kind of mandating uh, only electrical new vehicles in 2035, but what do you do about all the old vehicles still around in 2045? Uh, finally, and perhaps most interestingly, CDR is important for getting to net zero, but will the technology at 100, uh, uh, 100 million tons uh, be available? Uh, and 74 of that uh, 100, we think, is direct air capture. So the question is by 2045, will things be there? So that's stimulating new thinking about if not that, what else? Thanks. John, go ahead and join us one chair over. We'll make this a comfortable living room uh, dialogue. I've been given the license to extend into your break time by four minutes. So stay with us. Uh, in part, I know you are interested and I don't want to deprive you of that opportunity, but that means we have 15 minutes right now for you in this open session to express your own interest from the context where I know you all have rich exposure to direct challenges that test the speed of transition against the barriers to participation that you've seen analyzed and presented here today. I would like to ask Maxime and Michael, is that true? Yes, great. Please be alert to people who are in the middle. And I'm asking you now to raise your hand so that Maxime and Michael can come to you. And I'll be asking for you to announce yourself and your background before you speak. Michael, I see someone right down here at front. Hi, uh, my name is Larry Huff. I'm from Solvay. So I have uh, more of a global question. So 
as industry and municipalities go more towards carbon neutralization, how do we take steps to offset uh, emerging economies and, and, and other places in uh, South America, India, that might kind of offset what, what we're trying to do or what industry is trying to do? A wonderful question, and one that actually has a direct linkage to the questions that were raised by Robert in the first panel on leakage, meaning around uh, the global economy. And for multinational corporations that are here, that's, of course, a really salient question to your management strategies. I know that though we did feature in this panel three, four academics that were all a part of the program led by Principal Investigator Lynn Orr, former Under Secretary of Energy and Science uh, here with us today. The California context, rich as it is, is not explanatory for those of you that are working in global context, but we do have extensive global engagement experience here. Professor Wyant, would you like to begin with the response? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Again, it's probably, as Bob indicated, uh, all about the accounting. Uh, there are uh, a lot of studies out there now, several, the Energy Modeling Forum has done on uh, trade and uh, climate, looking at explicitly things like leakage. I would say the, the uh, advanced version of the, some of the, maybe not advanced, a different take on that is that we now have the CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Proposal in, in the um, uh, European Union, actually partly based on one of our studies that was run through uh, Germany of all things. Uh, but we also have now, uh, not much discussion yet, Holmes, of IRA explicitly, I think because it's relatively new and hard to do. So I think a big part of the negotiation there will be, is IRA in consistent or inconsistent with the CBAM things? Now the way, I, I do think, maybe I'm a diehard uh, um, optimization guy, you can shadow price some of these things out. So if we're gonna have restrictions on the source of uh, the equipment we used for solar or EVs or batteries in California, that's gonna cost something. But on the equity side, this is the White House credo right now, you've, heard, you've all heard it. Um, people, we gotta help people, uh, voters, um, uh, places and projects. Uh, so I think we, we, we uh, probably need to go in both directions to do the global accounting again and modeling, but also the bottom up, the very difficult but very important bottom up work to see who's being affected on the ground in real life in real time. To unpack some of Professor Wyant's acronyms there, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, potentially coming into attention space with the border adjustment mechanisms that are being considered as solutions for transition uh, around the world. I think that we do see a, a veritable army of Stanford graduates and faculty members participating in the Biden administration trying to address these questions uh, head on. I see Maxim in the back. Um, Speak have, up, excuse me, say that again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can. Yeah. Um, I have a question about carbon sequestration challenges. Um, the legal challenges of whatever the number is, tens of thousands, maybe more, individual property owners who have mineral rights for whatever goes into the ground under their property and how to get around that. These are not likely to be people who are interested in any of this stuff. Want to hand that to our CCS expert? Uh, I'm, well, Holmes, I don't know that I'm a CCS expert. Um, it's very hard, is the short version. I've um, been watching the CCS, by the way, I haven't, I haven't written many papers in it recently, but I've been watching the CCS space for 15, 17, 18 years, I guess. Um, there's a variety of challenges. Um, it's not clear to me at all that the issues are really technical. Right, so it's not clear to me at all that we can't do the kind of monitoring and verification and, and you know, um, so, you know, integrity of the seals and these kinds of things. We can do this kind of stuff, right? The oil industry has done this kind of subsurface work for a century now. Um, I think what you raised is more around, like, are people going to want this to happen? And in particular, the people with the property rights. And I think that's probably where this is all going to um, stick. I mean, one of the interesting things of the pathway study that, that John presented, and I'm, I'm involved with as well, is how important carbon dioxide removal is to the state's plan. And so it's bigger than anything else by a wide margin. Um, and so we have a decarbonization plan, but that decarbonization plan has 70 million tons a year of removal from the air by 2045. And so this is a big deal. Um, 
I don't. I, I wish I had an answer for you. If you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're asking questions, looking for answers, I guess you're looking in the wrong place. Um, I'm kind of. Um, I, I guess I have serious questions, maybe like you, whether that's actually going to materialize, or whether we're setting ourselves up for a massive fight, which is one of the reasons why an alternative strategy we might say, look, okay, state, 70 million tons a year, is it realistic? Can we do that? Or should we push harder on these other aspects? Maybe we need more batteries. Maybe we need more other things. Because it's just, it's just, yeah, I guess I would say, I, I don't want to say it won't happen. I guess I'm just, I, 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 I'm, I'm inferring in your tone um, that you're skeptical, and I'm skeptical too, I guess. So I, um, yeah, I don't have an answer other than that. Thank you, Professor Bryant. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Greg Hart uh, from Calgary, Canada, Future Fit Cities. When I was looking at one of the charts, I could see the COVID impact showing the, you know, the declines in emissions. And that tells us something about reorganizing the way that we live. And so when I look at these models and we talk about carbon capture and we talk about technologies being brought to bear electrification, is there any modeling going into this or is anybody working on any modeling that says, if we start to reorganize the growth of society, what kind of impacts that's going to have on these goals because I am, equally skeptical about, you know, using carbon capture at scale to somehow hit these 2045 kinds of targets. So I'm just curious if anybody's modeling that, especially with the example, the natural experiment of COVID um, changing some of that stuff. Thanks. Yeah, we, we, we've been doing a little bit of that with a, I co-advise an EI per graduate student, um, uh, Ranjitha, with a um, civil engineering professor, uh, Rishi Jain, and she also works somewhat with Inez. She's been doing some, some very, very high resolution modeling of this. And her question is, well, A, looking at COVID as a natural experiment, as you said, but then also trying to project forward, what happened to, or what can we, what can we expect happened to overall demand for energy with the work from home shock? And so she's extremely high resolution data. She's focusing on the Bay Area for now, but data down to census tract uh, she has a transportation model where people um, uh, basically work and where they live. She also has a home energy um, uh, model and then a commercial energy model for the commercial buildings. Very high resolution uh, building scale data sets from the US federal government. Essentially they have these data sets of essentially every building on record and its basic characteristics so you can do a model. So she's doing this very granular work. Um, I would say one of the more interesting, she's out on maternity leave, she's got a little baby, which is great, but um, otherwise she would probably be here in the audience. But what, one of the interesting things that's come out of that is a couple things. Um, one is that the, the impact of COVID was kind of smaller than you would think. And I think this is, many studies have found this in some ways, because I think we're a bit bubbled in the kinds of work that we do. And, the, and, and there's a lot of people who couldn't work remotely and were continuing to, to drive, right? And so I think there was maybe less of an impact than like in my sort of mental headspace, how big of a deal was COVID? Well, it was a very big deal. Uh, and for a lot of people in software and finance and management, you know, that was, it was a very, it could be a very big shock, but I think overall it actually was a little bit less than we expected and there was a lot more commuting that stayed on. And then the other thing was interesting is she's trying to couple the transport and the building energy use. And so the building energy use actually claws back some of the work from home benefit because you end up partly running some commercial sites and some, and, the, um, and some home energy use, right? And so what ends up happening is you have some of the efficiency associated with reducing driving is, is kind of clawed back and, and, and taken back by, um, by the fact that now there's multiple locations um, some people are working from home, some are from the office, right? And so those are the, we're, we're not done with it yet, but some kind of some interesting um, initial results. Um, we haven't incorporated much of that in our modeling. We could, right? We could zoom in on that. I don't know, Ram, do you want to? Yeah, we published two major papers and studies on this. One more at, you know, the county level, state level, across the United States and across the world. And one of the things that was quite striking is that COVID dip was quite significant in that very first year of COVID. And after that, we basically rebounded even before all of the shelter in place was over. 
Then in a follow-up study working with PG&E, we were able to actually go through data for a lot of the commercial buildings and residential buildings here in California. And we note the two of the uh, points that Adam just made. One, a compensation between what happens in residential and commercial. The second was the commercial dip was much smaller than expected. Mm. And my colleague who's here, Jacques Chalander, has been doing a lot of experiments on like building cooling and so on on the campus. Um, and, and he can provide more light into this. But one of the aspects seems to be a lot of the buildings, their energy consumption is not that much tied to the occupants. So unless a company consciously decides to shut down a site, you know, those savings are going to be smaller. And manufacturing and industrial are huge sectors in terms of energy, and I don't think that is necessarily going away. Affected, yeah. Where behavior will help, I think, is in what we discussed earlier. Aligning your consumption more with where the production of clean energy is cheaper. That's going to be a huge issue, and I'm sure, I think, in Adam's model, we could verify yeah. the benefits of that very clearly. Yeah. So uh, I've seen a lot of these studies, and uh, as much as I didn't want to see the results, they are probably uh, good, valid, uh, uh, extremely important results. On the other hand, uh, a generalization of what Ram just said, uh, I think there is some hope that uh, everybody, high-level policymakers, low-level policymakers, all of us, are now more aware of the vulnerabilities we have. This is kind of sustainability writ large. So relative to pre-COVID, we may be more concerned about chip supply chain shortages and shortages of everything else. And that also has a strong equity component. The one thing we learned in our study that I wasn't anticipating as much is a lot of these disadvantaged communities uh, don't only suffer from high levels of pollution of any sort, uh, but they're also what we now call, because of COVID, frontline workers. So they're, and actually our sponsors are boiler makers, truck drivers, farmers, and whatnot. So I think particularly in a place like California, this may not catch on as fast, but it may uh, around the world. This is a dominant thing. I think it's been said by many people in California without engaging the uh, disadvantaged people through uh, environmental uh, justice or social justice more generally, uh, we're probably not going to make very much progress towards our climate goals here. So I think that is something that I'm uh, fairly optimistic about, or at least more optimistic now, sadly, than before COVID, because I think we've kind of, not to use a much maligned word, we're a little bit more woke to what the stakes are. If we do too much, you know, highly optimized, uh, just-in-time uh, supp uh, inventory supply chains, uh, what the consequences of that, the risk of that might be. And who bears those risks matters, right? Yeah. And who bears right. those risks are often not Stanford professor on a stage, right? So, uh, although I think That's Mark Rostin probably could actually do that. Yeah. Probably the only person I know. Yeah, we're, we, we can be fairly insulated, and I try not to be, but it's, that's the reality, right? Friends, I think uh, I want to draw some connections, not just between our speakers here, but between the sessions and even between the days, between today and yesterday, to point out that about six months ago, I was on this stage hosting Stanford Energy Innovation Days with two CEOs, one from the Bits and Watts program that Ram has helped start. And Amit Narayan was telling us about Autogrid, a company with 6,000 megawatts of demand under management in 18 countries, a, a level of scale that has been astonishing to develop in just a short amount of time, and with the capacity to rival the impacts in the state of California of the COVID stay-at-home policies, yeah. for example. This is just one way of drawing the connection between the energy innovation ecosystem at Stanford and the pace at which it can deliver responses that are not even anticipated by modeling teams that haven't abstracted mathematical representations of solutions that we haven't even seen yet. Yeah. This gives us a reason for striking a tone of optimism, not techno-optimism, but one that is actually related to the potential for applying legal theories financial strategies, and social sciences to unveil and illuminate pathways forward that are defying the deductive reasoning of technology models that can sometimes lead us to a kind of statement we just heard from Professor Brandt, which I think is admirably humble. Wow, our models foretell 
millions of tons of carbon dioxide removal that might not be there in the span of 20 years. But what are the implications for a community of thought leaders that are in partnership with some of the largest organizations on Earth, awake to the imperative and the reality that when we focus on equity as a central strategy, it can actually beat the buzzer and move us farther and faster in a rapid transition that none of us can afford to wait for. I want to thank you for your attentive engagement throughout this session. I hope you will use the break to the best of your ability to seize on these professors and the other faculty members that are asking similar questions. And if you have been provoked by my remarks or what you've heard today, please join us at 1 o'clock in the living room here to discuss demand-side decarbonization as a forthcoming area of innovation within the Institute's community. Please join me in thanking the academic council members who have joined us today. <laughs>